So Newton did a great job figuring out how gravity works. He invented calculus, he figured out the equation, it was fantastically successful, and for hundreds of years, physicists were using it. The next person to really advance our understanding of gravity, though, was actually Einstein. So let's talk about Einstein's view of gravity. Einstein said, Newton did a great job, everything's working great, but you know what, let's just start from scratch, see what we know about gravity, see if we can come up with a different way of looking at it. So he said, let's imagine space as a giant sheet of rubber. Just try to visualize that, it's stretched in all directions. Now that's pretty much impossible to visualize in three dimensions, so instead let's imagine it in two dimensions. Imagine a big sheet of rubber stretched out in two dimensions, sort of like the surface of a trampoline. Okay, so let's say here's the surface of a trampoline, we're sort of looking at it in perspective, the bottom edge is the edge closest to us, the back edge is the far edge, it's a square trampoline, and I put some grid lines on it just so we can sort of visualize what's happening. So go ahead and draw this. Okay, so let's say we take a very small object, like a pebble, and we place it there in the middle of the trampoline. What would that do to the surface of the trampoline? I'm sure you'd all understand that it would maybe make a small dimple, it would maybe make it go down just a little bit, but it's, it's a very small object, it wouldn't have much of an effect on the surface of the trampoline. So really, nothing really changes very much. Well, let's increase the size of the object from instead of a pebble to maybe like a bowling ball. So imagine you put a bowling ball on the trampoline. So let's redraw the surface of the trampoline, the edges of it, and visualize trying to put a bowling ball there in the center. What would that happen? What would happen to it? Well, of course, it would sink down, right? It would really bring everything down with it. So here's sort of a picture of the bowling ball, sort of sinking down into the surface of the trampoline, which means the grid lines would also sort of be warped. So try to draw this as best you can. Okay, so the bowling ball sinks everything down, and all the parts of the surface of the trampoline are sunken down around it. Let's say we take the original pebble, and we roll it towards the bowling ball, or at least sort of towards the side of the bowling ball. What would happen? Well, the pebble is constrained to move along the curvature of the surface of the trampoline, which means that its path would start to bend, like so, right? Almost as if it were attracted to the bowling ball, right? In fact, if you were to roll at just the right speed, it might even go in a circle around the bowling ball, almost like it's orbiting. And so here we have a way of visualizing what masses do to space, right? Masses create fields, and Einstein's view, what that means is that the object actually alters the curvature of space. And then other objects nearby, if they're moving, would follow the curvature of space, and because of their path, it would seem like they're being attracted. And so when scientists and mathematicians started analyzing how space would be curved based on Einstein's view, they found they got results that were exactly the same as the results given by Newton's law of gravity. So here we have two completely different ways of visualizing how gravity works, and they agree with each other, even though they almost have nothing to do with each other. So then scientists were saying, well, what else travels through space? Well, light travels through space, right? So let's imagine a beam of light traveling from a distant star traveling through space, going near some sort of massive object. Well, since light travels through space, if space itself were curved, that means that light's path should be curved. And so if light passes near a massive object, it should actually bend in its path as it goes near it. And then a couple years after they postulated this, they actually went and observed light passing by some massive objects in the sky, and they saw, indeed, that the light's path was actually bent. It actually curves through space when it passes sufficiently near a massive object. In fact, if you have light coming from two different sides, on the other side of the massive object, those light rays would sort of converge, not exactly come together, but they'd come closer together. And this phenomenon is known as gravitational lensing. It's almost as if you put a giant lens in the sky, in, in space, and the light passing through got bent. And so that's a way we have of detecting where massive objects are in space. So let's up the ante. Let's say instead of a bowling ball, what if it's a ridiculously massive object? The more and more massive it is, the more it would bend the surface. Eventually, it would form basically a funnel. You ever see those coin donation things, and maybe like the mall or at restaurants where you put the coin in and it goes round and round and round, eventually goes into the funnel, right? That's sort of what we're visualizing here, right? So this object is so massive, and maybe relatively small compared to a picture here, that it pulls the entire surface down into sort of a funnel shape, which might be a little bit difficult to visualize. Let's try to add some grid lines here, what the grid line would look like near the surface, into almost like a pit, right? So here's some of the grid lines over here, like so. And maybe add some shading, okay? So basically we're looking at what looks almost like a like a hole, right? So 
a ridiculously massive object would bend space so much it would form sort of a funnel shape like so. Well, it turns out this is actually the model for a black hole. Do you know what a black hole is? If you come across this idea before, it turns out a black hole is actually a dead star. It's not a hole at all. It's actually a ridiculously massive object. So here's a brief history of the lifespan of a star. So a star is basically just a giant ball of hydrogen gas, and all the particles of hydrogen gas are attracting each other gravitationally. Right? And so they're pulling each other towards the center of the star, where they're under tremendous pressure. And the pressure produces nuclear reactions. And the nuclear reactions release lots and lots of energy. This is all the light and sort of different sorts of energy we get from a star. And the energy escaping the star produces almost sort of an outward pressure. And so for much of a star's life, the outward pressure of the energy leaving sort of balances the inward flow of gravity. And so the star is in sort of an equilibrium state for a good portion of its life. Well, eventually, it runs out of hydrogen gas, and so the fusion moves on to heavier elements, then it fuses those heavier elements, and on and on it goes, until eventually, the process stops. And so when the process stops, the outward pressure of energy sort of goes away, and now all these particles that are left in the star are still pulling each other inwards, and the star starts to collapse. And what happens next depends on the original mass of the star. And so if the original mass of the star is rather large, the inward pull all those particles coming towards the center, they actually bounce off, they rebound off of whatever is inside the center already, and it explodes outwards into what's called a nova or a supernova, and ejects all of its materials out into the universe. If it's of a very small size, the process, the star shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, and eventually the process stops, and it becomes basically what's called a brown dwarf, almost like a planet, like a big chunk of rock. And then sometimes it goes very, very, very small, becoming what's called a neutron star, where it's spinning very, very rapidly, producing lots of energy uh, as, it, it, as it spins. But if the original mass of the star was of a certain size, the process of shrinking just keeps going. It just keeps shrinking smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, becoming what's called a singularity. All the mass of a star in a single point in space. And that's what we're visualizing here creating what appears to be almost like a hole in space. Now, it's not really a hole, and plus this actually happens in three dimensions, but the idea is that all the mass of the star is still there in just one single point in space, and so the surface of space is warped so much that if you get to a certain radius, close enough to where the star originally was and star currently is, there's not enough energy in the universe to ever pull an object out, so it creates what seems to be like a hole in space. And since light follows the curvature of space, that means that if light gets within that radius, well, light following the curvature would go towards the center of this, towards the dead star, and the light could never escape. So it is a black hole, because it will not reflect light. Light goes in, or towards it, and never comes back out. Now, you might wonder what happens inside a black hole. Well, the problem is, if you send someone in, well, they'll never come out, because, again, there's not enough energy to get any sort of object out of it. And then you say, well, what if we send someone in and they send a signal out? Well, the signal, often carried on radio waves, is really a form of light. And since light can't get out, the signal can't get out. So the only way to ever know what happens inside a black hole is for you to go inside a black hole. The problem is that once you go in, you can't get out, so you can't tell anyone what happens inside a black hole. What would that experience be like for you? Well, one, for one thing, uh, the problem is that you are not a point object, and so... As you get closer and closer to that threshold radius, well, part of you would get there before the rest of you, which means more than likely you would actually be ripped to shreds before you ever got there. But let's assume you don't meet such a grisly fate. Let's assume you get there, right? Well, it turns out when space bends and space warps so much, time changes also. Things get very, very weird around this, right? If you ever saw the movie Interstellar, they talk about all these different changes in time when you get near massive objects, right? For you, things would appear to be normal. From, from an outside person's, uh, outside observer's perspective, they would see time expand pretty much to infinite proportions. And so they would be watching you move, and it turns out they would never actually see you get to the center of the black hole. But from your perspective, everything would seem to appear to be normal. But again, things get very, very strange, and there's all sorts of uh, aspects to physics that you can study on your own that would help expand your understanding of this.